Está listo. Sí, todo, todo. sí, ahora uh -huh. me dice que está transmitiendo vía YouTube. Vamos a, a actualizar aquí. Juan pregunta sí. algo ahí. Ahí está. Me sale okay. en el canal. Lo estoy viendo. Ok. So, welcome everyone to our second master lecture of the conference of uh, the critique on political economy. I am Luis Cortez and I'll be your host and moderator today, uh, transmitting from Berlin, as you can see from the clock uh, behind. Uh, I'm in another time schedule, so. Uh, and uh, before starting, I'll give some instructions to use the uh, simultaneous interpretation for uh, Spanish speakers who are connecting on our um, Zoom transmission. Eh, entonces, hay eh, interpretación simultánea que está disponible en Zoom. Eh, para usarla, eh, tienen que, eh, en el computador, si están desde el computador, hacer clic en el pequeño eh, globo eh, terráqueo que dice Interpretation eh, y seleccionar el, el lenguaje, del, digamos, el canal de, con el lenguaje que ustedes quieran. Eh, si están desde un teléfono celular, eh, tienen que apretar los tres puntitos eh, para que aparezcan las opciones y ahí en la, en la, en la opción language interpretation eh, pueden elegir el lenguaje que ustedes quieran. So now I'll give the same instructions in English for our English speakers. Uh, simultaneous interpretation is available through Zoom. In order to use it, uh, if you're in computer, please click on the world icon at the bottom right of your screen and then select the language channel of your choice. In case uh, you are using a mobile device, you just have to click on the three dots, then language interpretation, and then the language of your choice, and uh, press done. So uh, for the uh, conferences on the critique of uh, political economy, uh, the ones who haven't been on our previous uh, um, lectures and discussions, uh, the objective of these uh, conferences is the development of knowledge uh, for the organization of a uh, political action. As we exist in a political, uh, in a capital, capitalist society uh, where social work is organized privately in the form of a capital as value that produces more value, our interest is to advance over its determinations. In that sense, we see that the relationship with nature is of particular importance in South American countries as natural resource extraction, the climate crisis and the rent of land are central to the understanding of historical processes that are unfolding there. Uh, that's the reason why this master lecture is called uh, Value and Nature. So before uh, presenting our speakers for today, I would like to give thanks to the people who are helping us and also to the institutions who uh, made this uh, lectures possible. Uh, first of all, uh, to the program Simulus for Academic Projects of Graduate Students of Universidad de Chile, financed by the Department of Graduate and Postgraduate Studies. We, then also to the Master in Social Sciences of Universidad de Chile for providing us support for the conferences to its YouTube channel. And also to Jesus Rojo for helping us in the diffusion of the conferences uh, and from whose channel, a YouTube channel, we are now transmitting this lecture in Spanish. Also, we would like to thank Carmelo Velasquez for the technical support of these transmissions and to Aldana Almaraz and Lucila O'Donnell uh, for providing the simultaneous trans translation for the lecture. So then, our first speaker uh, will be Professor Jason Moore. Uh, Professor Moore is an environmental historian and historical geographer at Binghamton University, where he's a professor of uh, sociology. He's the author and or editor most recently of Capitalism in the Web of Life, Anthropocene, no, Capitalocene or Anthropocene, Anthropocene or Capitalocene, Nature, History, and the Crisis of Capitalism, and with Raj Patel, A History of the World in Seven Cheap Things, amongst other books and essays on environmental history, capitalism, and social theory that have been widely recognized. He also coordinates the Global Ecological Research Network. Our second intervention uh, will be from Professor Juan Cornbley, PhD in history from the University of Buenos Aires, uh, where he's currently an adjunct researcher at the National Commission for Scientific and Technolo Technological Research, CONICET of Argentina. He's also a professor at UBA 
and the and in Universidad Nacional eh, de General Sarmiento. He specializes in the historical development of South America with special emphasis on class struggle and the appropriation of land rent by different historical subjects. So, um, Professor Jason Moore will have 30 minutes for its presentation, and then uh, Professor Juan Corblet will have uh, 30 minutes for its presentation. After that, uh, we'll open a round of questions, uh, comments uh, between uh, both uh, speakers and also from uh, people who are watching us on YouTube and on uh, Zoom. Uh, in that sense, I would like you to. I, I would like to ask uh, if you want to make a question. Uh, if you could please put question like in caps, uh, so we could uh, identify where they are. Like aside from the comments, that would be uh, great. So, uh, we, uh, without much further to say, uh, I'll give uh, the word to Professor Jason Moore. Uh, please, you have 30 minutes from now. Perfect. Thanks so much. What an honor to be here. And uh, it's, it's a, an exciting moment, as I understand, in Chile, and it's an exciting moment of possibility in the world in the era of the planetary inferno. So the big question is, what does value, what does Marx's conception of the law of value have to tell us about the class struggle in the web of life? And what does it allow us to see about the political economy of climate limits in the present conjuncture. Well, I want to begin by stressing the what I call the double register of chief nature, which is the double life of value, of the law of value. That is value as, on the one hand, socially necessary labor time, and value, on the other hand, as the ethico-political cheapening or valuation of some parts of life and the devaluation of others. So I would qualify the, my talk as saying that it is not at all about nature. Nature is an imperialist category, and it is a category of practical violence developed through civilizing projects from 1492 all the way to the present. It is about the creation of two zones of the civilized and of the savage, the natural. And in the rise of capitalism, indeed, ever since, the vast majority of humankind, especially through race and gender, have been put into the category of nature, the better that they could be cheapened, both in an economic sense and in the sense of geocultural domination, to cheapen, to treat with less dignity. Hmm. So these are this is a fundamental tension in how the world ecology conversation deploys historical materialism to bring in not just the Marx moment, but also, if you will, the Gramsci moment. Of course, from Marx, he recognized this from the very beginning, and you can see this in how he speaks of uh, capital's view of, of labor as disposable labor power, the disposable human material elements. That's all that capital sees. Of course, working classes that are forged and formed and struggle through that dialectic of class struggle, begin to understand the possibilities for liberation through various forms of proletarian internationalism, which are today absolutely necessary if we are to combat and then to transcend the biospheric dictatorship of capital in the era of the planetary inferno. So value in the register of world ecology allows us to begin putting together the geophysical and biophysical moments of planetary crisis with uh, the contradictions of value. Here, I am less concerned about whether or not you agree with Maito's uh, assessment of the long-term secular decline in the rate of profit, and more concerned about putting these two moments together, that is the moment of capital accumulation and the moment of the web of life as differentiated moments of a singular antagonism. These are differences in unities, to paraphrase Marx from Capital. So this is expressive, of course, of the crisis of surplus capital accumulation in the present moment. Here again, we see the collapse of investment, the collapse of, uh, and the collapse of the rate of profit, especially in the imperialist centers. Uh, over the past uh, 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 few decades. 
And again, we see what the impact of climate crisis in suppressing yield productivity growth for the major cereal crops in the world. This tells us that the very foundation of the law of value, which are the capitalist agricultural revolutions beginning in the low countries, in England, in the plantations of the new world, uh, that model of producing more and more and more food with less and less and less labor power, that is the foundation of the law of value and the socio-ecological conditioning of the law of value is uh, now uh, coming to an end because of the climate crisis, not purely because of physical, geophysical impacts, but that is a gigantic part of it. There will be no new agricultural revolution. This signs the death warrant for capitalism, whether something uh, better will, uh, more sustainable, more democratic, more egalitarian will come next that's up to us. So this is the point of view of world ecology, which is not a theory, but a conversation that ex seeks to extend the crucial class struggle, web of life, and geocultural political moments of historical materialism. Above all, in the context of the climate crisis, it argues against the tyranny of man versus nature thinking. That, of course, is the thinking characteristic of uh, the environmentalism of the rich countries, which I call simply the environmentalism of the rich. And it indicts and implicates sustainability as an imperialist project from its very origins in the late 1960s and early 70s. Our approach says that geohistory unfolds and incorporates a geological moment, but is not reducible to geology. This is very close to what Marx and Engels say in the German ideology. So geohistory is our interpretive mode that internalizes the antagonisms between life and capital, between modes of life, to quote Marx and Engels, and again, quoting them, modes of production, to understand these as rich totalities of many determinations. So this, take, this point of view takes seriously historical materialism as a, as an environment making dialectic that is established from the very first formulations of historical materialism, indeed uh, from the manuscripts in 1844 and then immediately after as Marx flees Paris and, and finds himself in Belgium writing his uh, 800, 800, nearly 800 page opus, The German Ideology, which was never published. So don't despair if you have a hard time publishing your ideas. Um, this is the idea that class society is fundamentally a producer of webs of life, but also a product of those webs of life. There is a dialectical antagonism of emergence, of emergent contradictions that are always a, uh, take the form of differentiated unities. So with the rise of capitalism, we have long before the emergence of commodity fetishism, we have civilizational fetishism. This emerges very, very early in the initial conquests of uh, the new world after 1492 and matures uh, following the great debates between Sepulveda and Las Casas in 1550 and 1551. So what we see in the history of capitalism are a succession of civilizing projects, the Christianizing, civilizing, developmentalist, and today a sustainability project. On the other side are the savages, those who are unreasonable, irrational, warlike, who must be civilized, who must be dominated, who must be controlled in the interests of the civilizing project, ideologically speaking. But of course, the point all along is to impose these so-called rational systems of domination. I quote from Max Weber here, these rational systems of domination that serve to advance the rate of profit and to reduce the cost of production in order to create new investment opportunities. So in this, nature emerges very, very early and indeed before modern racism and sexism in order to structure this wildly uneven and violent world of the civilized and the savage, the civilizer and nature. And this is really crucial to understanding the origins of capitalism's law of value 
and the primitive accumulation of class formation, which occurs, let me underscore, not just or even primarily in England. It begins earlier in the Low Countries and, of course, in places like Brazil and then the West Indies on a grand scale uh, following uh, the 1570s. It is important to understand that these dynamics of class formation are indeed racialized and gendered after 1550 on the basis of these civilizing projects and imperial bourgeois naturalism. That's why the dynamics of domination that are so important to the super exploitation of the world's proletariat are framed in terms of naturalized language and naturalized discourse. That woman in Silvia Federici's phrase became the savage of Europe. This is an indictment of bourgeois naturalism, which lives with us today in the popular Anthropocene discourse, in planetary boundaries discourse, and all the rest. That is, to protect nature involves, for James Lovelock, the militarization of borders, for E.O. Wilson of biodiversity fame and half-Earth fame, it involves more imperialism, more enclosure. For nature preserves across the global south, it means militarized surveillance as a means of using nature, the practice of nature, the ruling idea of nature, as a concrete instrument, not only of domination, but of domination to serve uh, labor productivity and the advance of the rate of profit at every turn. So at the core of this notion is an idea, it takes seriously the dialectical antagonism of exchange and use through value as a global relationship. And what this means is in identifying the antagonism of use and value and use and exchange is it looks at those necessary, socially necessary sources of unpaid work provided by whom? Well, as Maria Mies says, women, nature, and colonies. But not, and, and the myth is that is certainly for women and so-called nature, the myth is that those somehow have something to do with nature. They do not. Nature is everything the bourgeoisie does not want to pay for. The, uh, the dynamics of value accumulation that take place through the cash nexus depend on every turn, at every turn, they depend upon the extra economic appropriation of the unpaid work of women, nature, and colonies. So this puts together these moments of cost minimization, of productivity advance, and the ethical political devaluation of the lives and labors of the vast majority of humankind, but also of the web of life as a whole. For every proletariat, there is an expansive femitariat providing unpaid work necessary for labor power to uh, produce capital, and a biotariat, that is webs of life overwhelmingly unpaid in order, uh, uh, whose work is extracted in order to provide the foundation for so-called normal accumulation. As Marx always points out, he's always making sarcastic comments about this, that yes, at, at times capital in its normal functioning appears to uh, be working according to eternal laws. And here he's mocking Thomas Malthus and other uh, classical political economists. So this is a way of bringing into play a larger realm of class struggle in the present climate crisis. To understand the climate crisis as a class struggle means that we need to understand that the proletariat, the planetary proletariat, includes not only the normal state of the world proletariat, which is always, as Emmanuel Wallerstein reminded us for decades, a semi-proletariat, which is to say that the proletariat also depends, as I just emphasized, on the unpaid work of the femitariat and of the biotariat. This together, this trinity is what I would call the, the planetary proletariat. And the struggle for a biotarian socialism is absolutely dependent upon understanding how value at once seemingly separates and also intimately connects, dialectically connects paid and unpaid work, human life and extra human life at every turn. 
So this is a way of beginning to understand the long-term ideological and geocultural history of capitalism as directly implicated in the worldwide class struggle, class formation, class politics, imperialism as the bourgeoisie's preferred way of waging the class war, to put those questions together with geocultural domination with the epistemological questions of otherwise anti-communist but illuminating figures like Walter Mignolo, and uh, to really begin to understand that super exploitation and the domination, uh, the forms of domination that emerge in historical capitalism are immediately and intimately connected with the formation of the law of value as a regime of socially necessary labor time. And so I'm not going to go through all of this. There's a lot of text. We have a little bit of time. So I'm just going to uh, blow through some of these slides uh, without going through all of the details. But here is what I want to say, that sexism and racism emerge roughly at the same time. They emerge roughly between 1550 and 1700. This is the period of capitalism's first great climate crisis, the so-called long, cold 17th century. It is a moment of ferocious class conflict and a proletarian internationalism in which uh, radical working class soldiers in England uh, uh, refuse to go to Ireland. They call for the abolition of slavery. There is uh, an extraordinary revolutionary moment that begins then and that in fits and starts, we see the emergence of forms of proletarian internationalism afterwards. But in any event, what we see between 1550 and 1700 is the formation of racism and sexism as a direct response to the climate class struggles of this era. And their raw material, if you will, their raw ideological raw material comes out of Prometheanism that is the domination of man over nature, which has little to do with humanity and nothing to do with the web of life, but is a civilizing set of claims and projects designed to naturalize every potential obstacle to the development of the capitalist mode of production. From Prometheanism comes naturalism and the entire discourse and concrete institutional and cultural practice of racism, sexism, and other forms of domination in the modern world. So this is just a very uh, a brief and schematic illustration that what we are looking at in the law of value is the translation of physical and life-making activities into socially necessary labor time and into capital, which is value in motion. But value in motion is never a closed circuit process. It is always an open circuit process because its contradictions are simply too explosive to be contained within a neat and tidy closed circuit of capital. This, of course, is Rosa Luxemburg's groundbreaking contribution to understand imperialism as vitally necessary to the periodic waves of restoring the conditions for capital accumulation by moving to the frontiers and securing by violence and geocultural domination, uh, forms of cheap work, cheap energy, cheap raw materials, cheap food that are necessary to reset and reestablish the conditions for the expanded reproduction of capital. So we want to be cognizant all along of these two moments of crisis. These are not separate moments. And the ideological struggle today is not only against the corrupt oligarchs of the imperialist centers who refuse to do anything about the climate crisis. It is also about their ideologues who work under cover of environmentalism and saving nature. In the words of Johann Rockström, the uh, uh, leading climate, Germany's leading climate scientist at the Potsdam Institute, he's Swedish, but he's in Germany. He says, we need bankers and executives to solve the climate crisis. He is a paid scientific ideologue for sustainability in its imperial form today. We need to challenge the idea that anything about capital can be used to rescue the planet, to save the planet. No, indeed, a different course is necessary. 
So in this light, we need to ask very seriously from the standpoint of value accumulation, is this a developmental crisis? That is uh, the kind of crisis that racked the world in the late 19th and early 20th century at the time Luxembourg was writing. Uh, that is a crisis that can be resolved through new waves of imperialism through new frontiers of cheap nature, or is it an epical crisis of capitalism itself that resembles, for example, the crisis of feudal Europe, which also occurred during a climate crisis, which, uh, in which the class revolt of peasants and workers refused uh, to acquiesce to feudalism's law of value, that is the metric of land productivity under Lord uh, under seniorial hegemony. So we need to ask very serious questions about this. Is it an epical or is it a developmental crisis? We can only begin to answer these questions by returning to the terrain of historical materialism, which insists that these questions are above all world historical. We must resist in eco-socialist discourse the uh, uh, attempt to dissolve world history into the acid bath of theory. Go back to Marx and Engels and their critique of, uh, of the German uh, uh, idealist, the young Hegelian saying uh, that they only combat phrases against other phrases. No, we have to return to the specific historical turning points of the development of the law of value as a law of cheap nature and look at the long-term large scale patterns of the law of value geographically, historically, of course, at every turn in, in relation to a world ecology of power, profit, and life. So I am nearing the end of my time here. So I want to skip through and just make a few basic points. First of all, we are often told it is easier to imagine the end of the world than to imagine the end of capitalism. A world historical perspective says different. No, indeed the major episodes of unfavorable climate change across the past 2000 years are moments of significant popular unrest, of political instability. They are in short moments of real political possibility at which the old order is overturned and new modes of production can be established. This happened twice over the past 2000 years with the collapse of the Roman West in the fourth and fifth centuries in an era of climate crisis, and it happened with the crisis of feudalism. Don't let anyone tell you the crisis of feudalism was a Malthusian crisis. It was emphatically not. It was a crisis in which the peasants and workers of Western Europe imposed a historic defeat on Europe's feudal ruling classes in the midst of a dramatic climate, class, disease, and economic conjuncture a civilizational epical crisis if there ever was one. Here, just to, uh, just to give you a sense of the dramatic shifts whenever there are downturns in uh, favorable, that is, let me repeat, uh, whenever there are moments of unfavorable climate, there are moments of political and economic crisis in modes of production in the Northern Hemisphere, looking at Europe in these cases. This is true for capitalism as well. The crisis of the 17th century, the climate crisis of the 17th century was partly the result of what Lewis and Maslin, the geographers call the Orbis spike. That is the decline in carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere over the 16th century as a result of new world genocides. What was the driving force behind the new world genocides? Slaving cheap labor. This was very much a consequence of class formation in the Americas under colonial conditions, which is, of course, the bourgeoisie's favorite mode of class formation, where it can use the power of imperialism. So this is not the first climate crisis. I'm sorry, I'm just going to run right through this and remind everyone that the particular ideological class um, and climatological conjuncture of today is rooted in what happened across this long, cold 17th century. The, in these years between 1550 and 1700, we see the formation of the worldwide law of value. And uh, crucial to that is the trinity of the climate class divide, 
climate patriarchy, climate apartheid. So I'm going to sort of uh, flip through this to the very end because I want to respect our time and open opportunities for uh, conversations. Um, and just remind you in all of this that moments of unfavorable climate change represent, yes, moments of danger uh, for the vast majority of suffering over the short run. Over the middle run, however, they represent very potent crises of political rule and at times epical crises. I can talk much more about why I see the present moment as an epical crisis, but just recall our two moments, the biogeophysical moment of climate crisis, uh, uh, the crisis of life making on the one hand and the crisis of profit making on the other. Of this latter, there is no doubt, there is an unprecedented crisis of overaccumulation in the world, 19 trillion dollars in uh, capital is parked in zero or negative rate of return government bonds around the world. There are many other signs of uh, the collapse, the historic ethical crisis of the law of value. One of them is now the decades long stagnation in labor productivity growth. We can go uh, into much detail as we move all the way through this. So to conclude, what do I want to emphasize about the law of value? The law of value pretends that it's self-contained, but recognizes that it is not. And indeed, Marx is always reminding us of the centrality of the frontier of imperialism, of colonialism, in order to resolve the, uh, the supposedly internal contradictions of value in motion. That just as the proletariat in the early 19th century stood on the direct slavery of the plantation proletariat in the American South, so does the law of value historically stand on the pedestal of socially necessary unpaid work of webs of life in general and of women in particular. Hence the importance of this trinity of the planetary proletariat between the proletariat proper uh, femitariat, biotariat. These are, of course, dialectically constructed in which each moment is informed by the other, is interpenetrated by the others, and in which the boundaries themselves are subject to periodic significant revisions. So this is a way of coming to grips in a world ecological sense. That is, world ecology insists that all so-called social projects and relations and processes are always already relations with and within webs of life. That proletarianization and, and bourgeoisification are moments that yes, produce webs of life, but are also produced by webs of life. A statement which appears very, very early uh, in the foundational arguments about historical materialism. That this it becomes a socio-ecological way of grasping the real historical movement of the class struggle, of the planetary class struggle in historical capitalism. This is what Marx and Engels, of course, call the real movement of communism. Communism, not an, not an abstract ideal to which we aspire, they argue, but rather the real historical movement towards the possibility of uh, socialism and the expropriation of the expropriators. And in this, we need to uh, uh, move away from the standpoint of the planetary manager, which too many eco-socialists have adopted. This is the standpoint of sustainability, of the Anthropocene, of limits to growth. This is the boss's view of nature. To this, as revolutionaries, we need to say, no, another world is possible. Another class struggle is possible in the web of life. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, Jason, for your presentation. Um, now, uh, Juan has 30 minutes for his own uh, presentation. Please, Juan. Well, thanks to the organizers and for this opportunity and to all the, the Congress we are developing with interesting debates. And I think this debate is also related with all the previous sessions and the following next week. So maybe some things are going to assume 
we are debating on, but I'm trying to explain in this short time, uh, but maybe it's not possible to explain all. So I recommend to see the other uh, sessions of the Congress to understand better uh, my points. Uh, I was uh, thinking today ab about this uh, talk and what Jason was saying. Uh, my talk is about a critique on how is understood the relation with non-reproducible by human work commodities, land or ground, uh, it depends the, the translation on how we, we talk about, is about how we relate with non-produced by human, human work commodities, which are selling market as uh, equalized with human work, with human private, private work, but as Marx says, they have no value. They have a false social value. So this problem is a problem uh, which arises uh, from the beginning, from capitalism, as Jason was uh, talking. And it's a problem that put us in terms of class struggle. I agree with that. Maybe we're going to disagree how we understand class struggle, but it's a problem in terms of class struggle. When we are talking about uh, primitive accumulation, it's seen as the moment where wealth is accumulated in terms of um, land and goods, which are accumulated by capitalists. But primitive accumulation is about how the working class is created, how uh, uh, peasants are separated from the means of production, from the land, and are separate from the direct relations with uh, uh, rule before capitalism. So what we are seeing in this primitive explanation is not just the grabbing of land, privatizing of commons, because this wealth in capital is not a still value, it is not a mean of production where the working class produce the new value. So I think this is important and we're going to develop to the following uh, ways of understand the relation we non produce or non-reproducible uh, uh, commodities, that is this primitive accumulation is setting not just wealth in terms of physical wealth, but it's setting how the social relation is going to produce the life with these means of productions. The non-produced are the, the way of how the life is produced. So which we have to understand is that the subject is the human life in its new form, which arises as capital. And in this process of uh, primitive accumulation, we are seeing this new organizing production of new model production based on private and independent labor. And this private and independent labor is the key to understand what produce value. It's that the center of the uh, capital accumulation. The non produces goods which are not uh, transformed by this kind of work does not produce value. And not, not all the work done by the humans produce value. Only is valuable in terms of capital and appears as price and money, and money which is transformed by this private and independent labor. In this sense, when the conflict between the owners of non-produced uh, commodities appear, it first appear as a contradiction which appear between capitalists and the land owners, which is the classical debate between uh, David Ricardo and was first thought as they has not a solution in terms of private property and Ricardo put the solution in terms of free trade. And this, I, I put it this because I think it's important to understand that the problem with the land and the ground rent, which first appears as just uh, privatizing and ending with the commons or grabbing the, the, the land, then appears as a conflict between why you have to pay from the capitalist point of view from, for something which is not produced by private and dependent labor. And this was a conflict which arises 
as non, they has not a solution because of the private property. But it is already pointing us a problem, which is in terms of class, which is the conflict between the capitalist, which has to pay to the landowners. But this conflict, which is which was in the center of the problem of capitalism in its beginning, as it develops to a free trade or develops to international level, it starts to go in, in a different way of analysis and goes to an analysis we put in the relation of a colonial relation first. And in this sense, of, in this sense is viewed not as a problem intrinsic inside capitalism, but it's, it is put as a problem outside capitalism. In this sense, it appears as grabbing again, as primitive, primitive, permanent primitive accumulation, where it seems as, or pH, which is put the relation with these non-produced commodities, not just as a, when an original moment where uh, the producers are separated from their means of production, but it is put, it is, it is put as a problem of physical accumulation of wealth from one side and dispossession from the other side. In this sense, which appears a problem is that it starts to begin an analysis of the relation of the capital with non-produced or non-reproducible commodities just in one sense, in the sense of extraction, in the sense of dispossession, and in the sense of more complex views as an equal exchange, but they, they all are going in a sense of one direction of the wealth. The wealth is going to the imperialist countries by just dispossessing the rest of the world. And in this sense, it's a problem to explain what happens in those countries where it appears uh, wealth in terms of value, it appears money, and it appears a reproduction of capitalism. And the problem arises again, because it's just not one sense extraction, what, which never ends, which is how it's viewed, for example, for Luxembourg, or then David Harvey, or other authors of unequal exchange, which are seen just the one way where capitalism is not based on private and independent uh, labor, but it's based on uh, a direct relation, relation where uh, wealth goes from one side to another, not in its forms of value, but in forms of a direct relation. So in this sense, class struggle arises in a different perspective. It's not capital which produce as a, as a result of a relation where workers produce value, but it goes to an international level in terms of countries relating itself and struggle between countries. And the class struggle goes in a second level just as the, the way of this difference between countries uh, are, re are uh, working in time. And this erasing the particularly of what happens with non-produced and uh, non-produced commodities and put us on the problem of what is the ground rent? Because ground rent, which appears in David Ricardo and is developed on the analysis of Marx, is erased in this idea of uh, pH grabbing uh, an equal exchange they erase the particularity of the ground rent, or it put it in some different ways. It put in just like a relic of the past, some pre-capitalist relations which persist in the third world, or it's put it just a relation between peasants and landowners. It's just a local relation and not a general problem for capital. These two different views with which is put it as or a relic, or just a problem of uh, peasants and owners goes together to not seeing 
which is the particular place of ground rent as a false social value, but which exists to reproduce in first a landowner, but as landowner does not have to reproduce a community because it's not a, a commodity produced by human work, uh, allows to uh, struggle a dispute on this value, on this surplus value by other subjects. So which I want to introduce here is what we are talking in this Congress and different uh, uh, scholars and activists are, were talking in this Congress is the problem of ground rent when you see the specific and not just in a general way of direct relations, but the specific of ground rent in terms of value and capital. When you erase the problem of ground rent, you see just or international conflicts or local conflicts. It's like you're in just one abstract level where the war is a problem of domination and direct relations of power, or it's just a local conflict between indigenous communities or former uh, owners of the land and the transformations of the land. But the existence of ground rent put us in a problem which is in the center of the class struggle in terms of a national level. Why? Because capital is worldwide by this content, the relation of capital by commodities, which put in relation the producers of private and independent labor is a worldwide content which take forms in the national level. So the struggle around uh, class uh, ground rent takes place in a national level, which its content is worldwide, but you, you cannot escape the national level. And in this national level, when you put the ground rent or as something always going in one direction outside the country, then when you analyze internal cycles where ground rent appears in some moments as uh, the, the demand of uh, ground rent or primary goods rise and you have not a ground rent going in one direction, but arriving to these countries that have particular conditions of uh, productivity of labor, then you see that this ground rent is explaining the political process in the nationals in these national countries, as for example, South America. When you have these cycles of uh, rising prices in commodities, the ground rent is not just going in one direction to the imperialist countries, but arrives as an extra profit that is then dis disputed inside the country, even by capitals and uh, from other countries, but it happens inside these countries. When you eliminate the ground rent, you are analyzing the class struggle in abstraction of this kind, this form of surplus value. So you give potential to the working class or to the bourgeoisie, national bourgeoisie, or to the state as an autonomous subject that is not coming from a particular way they are appropriated the ground rent, but from an abstract uh, uh, forces correlation or an abstract power that you cannot explain where it's coming. So in this sense, what we see is that all the explanations that took place from this unilateral view of ground of wealth coming from periphery to the center as just grabbing an equal exchange, primitive accumulation, are the way the, the politically to um, compromise or to ex ex express an illusion of a national content of uh, working class or bourgeoisie class that can do an auto national autonomy or uh, national development, which is not explained by because they are not seeing the content of this moment of 
uh, wealth that explain the capability of reproducing national or capital or reproducing different kind of uh, uh, social uh, expenditure or industrial policies in a national level. By the other side, when you go to the local level of analysis, which comes, for example, for all the idea of primitive accumulation, permanent primitive accumulation, where what you are seeing are constantly uh, or non-capitalist uh, uh, people or non-capitalist societies or some kind of uh, uh, commonly ruled societies where, which happens when you are expanding the uh, economic frontier, when the prices arise, you expand the commodity frontier. And in this moment, you are changing the property of land. And local conflicts arise in these moments, like in the last years with the boom of commodities, you see are, are, are rising in, in prices which expand the frontier and leads to a lot of local conflicts. We see local conflicts everywhere in South America for water, for uh, mining places, for uh, different kinds of conflicts. And these local conflicts are put in terms of capital against some commonly ruled society. And in this idea of primitive accumulation or grabbing, there is not explaining which are what which what they are these subjects, these social subjects which are displaced or which are expropriated by this expansion of capital in terms of new property. And what we found is before is not a commonly uh, ruled society, a non-capitalist society, but it was already product of capital. Because the property of land in its common way or in its direct private way is just private property. When you see a commonly owned uh, land or rights that comes from legendary uh, you know, previously historically possession, it means a private property for the others in the so society. So what is in, in struggle is how is these lands are privately appropriate. It's not a struggle between common and private, but it's a struggle in already private with a new private property. So in this sense, it's important because which appears as a <clears throat> permanent primitive accumulation or dispossession is happening, but it's happening as a way of it is changing something inside capital. And what is happening in most of the cases is like that capital in its develop is condemning a part of the population as an overpopulation, which in this uh, change with property of land or with this expansion of new frontier are in some cases uh, condemning these people to be a overpopulation for capital or they were already overpopulation for capital and they see this moment of expansion as a way to have some portion of this ground rent as capital has to expand and some uh, lands which were not useful for capital start to be useful for capital in terms of appropriating ground rent, this population can be already overpopulation and be fighting to have a portion as ground owners or displace it as a, a overpopulation. In this sense, what we are seeing is that when you analyze these conflicts as or a national level or just on a local level, what you're seeing is a problem where, where comes any action that can uh, act with this problem differently. And from one side is seen a national level given perspective from the state, which 
appears to be has autonomy in a national terms, but when you see the ground rent, it was not autonomy, but was the way of ground rent was appropriated. And in the local level, you're seeing that there are a lot of people fighting this mining expansion, uh, soybean production, or different kinds of expansion of territory of the, the economic frontier, but are fighting back this in a local level, fighting us or overpopulation or just wanting to be a partial ground uh, land owner trying to share the ground rent. So uh, to finish my, my, my conference, I, I was wondering, well, if this is what is happening with these different kinds of theories, what put us the problem of ground rent is that capital as our social general relation <coughs> put the working class as an attribute of capital and the class struggle is not between free people which are in a direct in a which lost their freedom with the bourgeoisie but where freedom is already the way we are exploited we are exploited because we are already free we are free because in the previous accumulation there was a dispossession and this double kind of freedom arise we are free because we are uh, separated by of the means of production mostly the land and free because the direct relation is erased but this double freedom implies selling our working force so the working class arise already as a free social being but being social free is being exploited because by selling our uh, working force is why capital can valorize itself in this movement the working class arise as the one in the development of capital the capital develops the uh, uh, looking for the surplus the relative surplus value it develops the technology it develops the appropriation of non-produced uh, uh, to produce the means of production in the sense of producing more surplus value. But it all only produce more surplus value by the working class. And in the movement, it produce a transformation which puts at the working class as the one that organized the production. It organized the scientific labor that puts the uh, productivity at the center uh, and all the objectivation of the technology of the knowledge that puts more productivity looking for surplus value and this the movement of capital that is putting on the working class as the one that organized the production in a contradictory way where it puts also as a surplus population that capital has produced an overproduction it also produced an overproduction of commodities and the working class is a commodity and it does it not in a with a plan but just following the relative surplus value so in this moment is very synthetically where the working class is organizing the production erasing the former property in terms of erasing the small capitals and advancing a concentrating capital and it put the working class organizing the production instead of the uh, bourgeois or the uh, capitalists which are condemned to be just a representative of the property but not to organize the production so what is happening is that the class struggle is the way that capital reproduces itself it's not an outside confrontation between the working class and the bourgeoisie as two autonomous subjects that confront over how they appropriate uh, wealth but it's just a particular way in which the working class has to struggle to sell its working force by its value and in this class struggle 
makes the capital develop itself. So if the working class is a revolutionary subject, it is because the capital put it as a revolutionary subject. It because the capital is revolutionary itself and it's putting the working class as a revolutionary subject. And in this uh, movement of capital, the capital uh, confronts the problem of non-produced commodities. Because capital, when pays for the use of land with the ground rent, subtracts a part of the surplus value. And in this sense, capital needs to uh, eliminate private property on land. But by doing it, it put a problem on the general contradiction on uh, the general contradiction on, <coughs> sorry, the general contradiction on the private property. So the working class is the class that can go further in terms of uh, uh, eliminating the private property. So one of the first national ways which the working class appears as revolutionary in terms of a socialist consciousness, even if it's not just the socialist uh, realization, but with a socialist conscience, appears as revolutions where the working class has to eliminate the private property in land. It can do it in a revolutionary way, or it can do it in a more reformist way, but it has to appear in terms of uh, the, the working class political action. And it cannot happen just worldwide because the content is worldwide, but the form is national. But it has to recognize the existence of this ground rent and not just put it in terms or an um, international one direction uh, wealth appropriation in terms of imperialism or just a local problem where the contradiction is between private and common. For this, I think that for understand the problem, we cannot just erase the particularity of value because we, we, when we erase the particularity of value and the particularity of the private and dependent labor that produce value and we uh, put value just a general uh, natural relation, what we are doing is analyzing society as always ruled by value, as if value is something natural. And value has its particular form, is social determined form historically, and we cannot just put it in terms of one direction uh, wealth or local, but putting in its particular place in terms of capital allows us to understand better how the class struggle is developing and to develop a program that can, in a political term and in national terms, which can understand the worldwide content, develop a proper strategy. Thank you. Thank you, Juan, for your presentation. Uh, there are some questions now on the YouTube channel and also on the Zoom. Uh, I would like to read them, but first I would also like to give you some time for, because you are clearly presenting very different visions about the relationship between uh, capitalism and nature. Uh, so, uh, Jason, um, I would give you 15 minutes uh, to comment on uh, what uh, Juan said, and then Juan, you can also comment on what uh, Jason has to say about like this discussion. Well, okay, maybe I can keep my remarks a bit shorter. I need to leave at the top of the hour. So um, I would say I, I thought Juan, your lecture was outstanding. I see it as perfectly complimentary to the kinds of arguments that uh, I've been making. I agree that the uh, generative devaluation of uh, uh, various forms of work reclassified as non-work um, are absolutely essential 
to the conditions for value production. Sometimes my position is under is misunderstood, saying that unpaid work is directly uh, uh, directly produces value. That, of course, is uh, unsustainable within Marx's own model of value. However, what Marx always insists is that various forms of unpaid work are absolutely necessary to the operation of value. And that's why we can't conceptualize the, the law of value purely in economic terms or even purely in political and economic terms. We need to understand that there are ruling abstractions that emerge out of the historical geography of the law of value that enable the super exploitation uh, of especially uh, uh, what I'm calling the femitariat and the bioteriot. So these are the necessary conditions for the expanded reproduction of value. They are not directly constitutive of value itself. And what that does is to preserve the unity and difference. And that's very, that's very important. Most people, I don't think this is what you do at all, uh, Juan, but most people talking about value treat it as a closed system. That's undialectical, it's un it's, and it's not geographical, and it's not historical, uh, which is to say it's, it's a, a poor uh, way of treating Marx and Engels' revolutionary dialectics in the web of life. And that's it. Okay, uh, Juan? Yes, uh, oh, thank you, Jason, for the comment. And well, I, I, I don't know if exactly we are complementary. Uh, maybe there are some differences, but maybe we cannot develop in, in our time. But I, I would like to make some question that maybe goes to the point of the, the differences, which is first, how do you understand uh, where it comes the revolutionary uh, from the working class. So why the working class is revolutionary in your, in your explanation? Because at, at, as I see, you put it like, I don't really don't understand which is the particular of the working class. Uh, for example, with the relation with the peasants, where you put your explanation, you put the peasants, you put the different revolutions, but which is the particular of the revolutionary subjectivity of the working class, where it comes? Well, I would and simply then, I would simply return. I'm sorry. Was that where? Yeah. Uh, I, no, no, I, okay. I would simply return to Marx and Engels of the German ideology, and the Communist Manifesto to understand that the development of capitalism uh, creates world historical connections through the commodity form, and also through the exercise of geopolitical power. This is the point about primitive accumulation being a recurrent. Uh, feature of capitalist imperialist politics. Uh, so the, the, uh, uh, the elaboration of combined and uneven forms of world historical transformation across uh, the world uh, leads to, of course, as we learned from the manifesto, the concentration of, of working classes and uh, the increasing uh, awareness of their uh, sort of global emancipatory possibilities, which ex which which go well beyond a certain Eurocentric formalist conception of working class. That's one that I wholly and totally reject. Uh, that's why I'm not uh, a so-called eco-socialist or fossil fuel Marxist, because the forms of the proletariat as uh, radical workers in 17th century England understood included uh, the indentured and enslaved uh, workers on plantations. It included uh, the Irish, et cetera, et cetera. So we're always looking at the combined and uneven linkages between uh, what I'm calling the planetary proletariat, which only matures in uh, late capitalism. Oh, thank you. And, and the other point I was thinking is maybe more on the, the topic of the value, because you put this, uh, Two different two definitions of value, and when you go to the definition of value, which uh, goes uh, ahead of the problem of the working uh, of the human nature, you put it in terms of an ethical and how is conceived by the human. And the question was first, if you don't think you're erasing in this sense the the specificity of uh, capital by putting that uh, any work. Uh, produce values, 
So for example, you're putting in terms of value, which is a term of money. That's not, that's not my position. That's what I just said, that, that unpaid work, this is, this is a point raised, I think, quite eloquently by feminist Marxists. Um, Lise Vogel, Tithi Bhattacharya uh, came, came closest to getting it right. I mean, as close as I have, which is that the unpaid domestic labor does not directly produce value. It, is, it directly produces the necessary conditions for value. That the dialectical antagonism of value as socially necessary labor time Let's take it seriously as an uh, as an alienated contradiction, as an antagonistic unity. That the uh, that uh, value properly conceived as socially necessary labor time depends upon massive and ongoing flows of unpaid work, largely secured by extra economic means. Maybe Luis want to follow with the other questions, and then we can in the debate or answering follow. Yes, I have uh, general questions and also a question directed to specific uh, speakers. So the first one uh, was written by Manuel Casique uh, for both authors. Is the contradiction between exploitation of nature by capital and the need to preserve nature to reproduce accumulation in time unsolvable? If it isn't, how can capital reproduce itself in time and develop labor forces? If it is, then should we see this contradiction as the limit of capital? In that case, what is the role of working class political struggle? That's the first one. And that's on the uh, Zoom channel. Uh, from the YouTube channel, we have uh, two questions. Uh, the first one from uh, Alejandro Jacobone, which says, why nature is an imperialist category? This is uh, directed to, to Jason. Uh, nature does not exist without capitalism social form. What's, what is the essential relationship uh, between human being and nature? And then there's another question in the YouTube channel, uh, which is uh, not formulated to any um, speaker in particular, which asks uh, how do the new uh, legal forms such as the COP and the, regul and the environmental regulation uh, relate with the form that uh, the uh, class struggle adopts? How could this be explained, this relationship? So whoever wants to answer first, maybe Jason. Well, the question about the emergence of the real abstraction nature is quite clear that capitalism is the first civilization to create a uh, dualist rationality of world domination, which is also an ethos of planetary management. Uh, Descartes' intervention simply crystallized already uh, uh, existing material, cultural, economic processes of planetary management to concentrate knowledge in the hands of the bosses and to treat everyone else as hands, as extended things in Descartes' uh, uh, phrase. So th this, is a, this is a fairly straightforward question of intellectual and cultural history. This is how civilizing projects work. They redefine webs of life within which humans, of course, are embedded as Marx insists, by the way, repeatedly, when he is talking about labor as a specifically harnessed natural force, in any event, uh, the invention of this dualist rationality of planetary domination is one of the first obvious forms of modernity as a capitalist civilization. This is civilization and savagery, which is exactly how various empires of this time in the 16th and 17th century spoke of the problem. Later, they spoke of uh, civilizing missions, of developmentalist projects, uh, old wine uh, put into new bottles. So um, I'm, I'm losing track of all the, the, the conversations. So maybe uh, Juan, you can say a few things and uh, that will jog my memory. Yeah, there was a question about the limit of capital and and how we can understand the, the, if capital can destroy itself by just uh, destroying the nature. I, I think that what, well, the destroying, if capital does this, it destroys the humanity. So, uh, because humanity is organized in a capital way. It's not that humanity is in one side and capital in another side. So uh, what I think is that if capital is the form of the human, Kind is reproducing itself, and the development of the capital has a sense 
what we are seeing is in a contradictory way how the humankind is developing itself uh, to uh, appropriate the nature and its metabolism to itself in a more conscious way. But the way it does it is in this contradictory way where it develops by destroying a part of the working class, condemning to overpopulation, and this climate change and this problem that arises as a problem of uh, an abstract nature is not an abstract nature, but is always the condition of the producing of the working class. And in this sense, what we are uh, seeing is how capital is condemning not just all the humankind, but a portion of itself as an overpopulation, which capital is going to destroy. But if we only see the poverty and we only see the destruction of uh, elimination of, uh, of overpopulation, which is terrible, but it's the way capital develops, we're not seeing that capital develops itself by developing uh, the scientific uh, knowledge and develop itself as a self-consciousness of this problem. And in this sense, uh, the working class arise uh, as the problem, but also as the solution. So I, I don't see just a limit in terms of uh, external limit. I see that this development is putting the working class in thinking this problem. But what I see is that we cannot think this problem uh, outside the development of the political uh, action of the working class. This is a problem of a political uh, intervention and the ways it takes is uh, national its level because it's a worldwide problem, but even internationalism is a relation between nations. It's not just a worldwide action uh, abstracting from the uh, state, the, the national state. So we need to develop uh, how we think the development of the productive forces in terms of scientific knowledge that can uh, make this development of uh, a new kind of uh, technologies that do not destroy uh, ourselves, but it's going to take a way where it's going to destroy some people. It's, it cannot be escaped. So what we do with do our political action is being conscious of that and looking which is the way which is more has more potential. And in this sense, I think that the national level action has to realize that it comes from capital, it's not from outside, it came from a particular way of relation. It has to realize the existence of ground rent. It has to realize the problem of the property of land and had to arise with a program we develop, which capital take us in a more uh, uh, powerful way, which is expropriating uh, the land owners and appropriating the ground rent for the case of the uh, countries which are specialized in producing uh, primary commodities and putting this in terms of a major scale of production and which puts the better technology and not in terms of local conflicts with put just the one side problem, the overpopulation and not its solution. When you put it in a problem as local problem, as just a local conflict, Indian conflict, which arise from some uh, mythical uh, ideas, uh, and not with a scientific objective knowledge, but with uh, organizing our action, with putting it as ancestral or uh, irrational thoughts to uh, change the nature uh, is not a solution. So I think that in terms of limits, what we have uh, in front is that capital is going to uh, develop ourselves as also in a contradictory way. We're going to, we have to develop the productive force in terms of better technologies and can uh, uh, organize the production in a better way, but it's going to take the form of destruction also. We cannot escape that. But yeah, that's absolutely, that's, I, I agree completely that there is a kind of eco-socialist naivete that the ruling classes will give up their wealth and power without a fight. And there is nothing in the history of the past two centuries that suggests that is so. Okay. Um, it was another one. But I yes, yes. The, yes, uh, there are a lot of questions. Uh, unfortunately, I won't be able to read all of them. 
Uh, but I'll select one for each one of you. Uh, so Jason, uh, for you, there was a question that in fact, the first one that was written and I didn't, I didn't read it, <laughs> um, made by um, Jimena Segura, uh, who's asking uh, about your opinion on the resurgence of uh, Malthusian type theories about an alleged overpopulation versus alleged uh, scarce resources in the current framework of the pandemic, and whether this approach is nothing more than an expression that masks, uh, that masks the current system of exploitation and current limits that territorial expansion may have to overcome the fall of the capitalist uh, rate of profit. Uh, so that's the question to Jason. Um, or Juan. Okay, I, oh, sorry. Oh, yes, please. Hmm? I, I think I can answer concisely hmm? that part of what we are seeing is uh, within the imperialist bourgeoisies an effort to essentially take capitalism into a tributary mode of production in which there would be markets, there would be finance, there would be proletarians, but politics would be in command. We've already seen plenty of examples of this movement. I think beginning obviously with the financial crisis in uh, 2008 to 2011, where uh, uh, key capitalist institutions become too big to fail, so-called. So we are already seeing a movement towards a kind of bourgeois authoritarianism that is related very much to the ramping up of the surveillance state under COVID conditions. That's one part of it. And so we can see this movement towards a an increasingly authoritarian solution to the problems of capital. And we're also seeing this with the construction of what the Transnational Institute calls in their most recent report, the global climate wall. So for the imperial bourgeoisies, the climate crisis is a security crisis. And so we're seeing a moment at which the, uh, um, the end of capitalism essentially is being recognized by at least a section of the world's ruling classes. And they are looking to engineer a tributary authoritarian solution to uh, the problems of capitalist accumulation by moving it into a tributary mode of, of accumulation in which politics and authoritarianism is in command. Against this, uh, well, we'll have to see. As Wallerstein would say, the chances are 50-50 of uh, the other side of the class struggle triumphing. Thank you, Jason, for your answer. Uh, now, Juan, I have uh, two questions from Alfonso Ciuffini. Uh, the first one is, what is your opinion of the studies of Sergio Agu? And the second question is, uh, don't you think that the, any definition of non-reproducibility cannot be absolute? I don't know why in this, what in specific about Bagu. I don't have in mind um, which is the problem particularly uh, we are he's maybe he can explain better. And well, yes, the non-reproducible uh, condition is not absolute. Uh, they are non-condition uh, condition non-reproducible, which can which can be first produced by human work and then non-reproducible, or they can be uh, just in their form of natural, it appears as uh, conditions, which when you reproduce it itself, it means more uh, labor time, more private and dependent labor time. So in this sense, you produce something, but the condition where the productivity, uh, uh, when it is higher, you cannot produce itself. So you can produce, for example, um, some conditions for uh, irrigation, but it means more work. So uh, the condition which the land doesn't need in irrigation is non-produced. So, but if there is a change in climate or is a change in the, how the, the proper uh, social relation change the weather or the geography is changing what is non-producible. So yes, it's not an absolute problem. But it is a difference because what I, I point and maybe uh, it would be interesting to, to establish a, a dialogue a confrontation with, with uh, Jason is, uh, which is specific from the work and makes difference with the, we cannot, you don't like it nature, but 
I, I understand why he doesn't like nature, the word nature, but the object, the, 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 the way you are, there's a difference between the uh, work and the subjectivity that it puts uh, is different. So yes, I think that this difference is important, which when I put something, the difference between produce and non-produce is because I put a difference between we, what is the specific of the social relation and how the human kind appropriates with a metabolism the, uh, the sorry, the, the, the nature to transform itself. So in this putting us something different, this objectiv objectivization, which appears with the word nature, uh, is true that makes some dualistic way separated but it's a way of how productive force advance. We have to go further that, we have to uh, uh, understand the relation with nature as part of our, ourself, but there is some specificity of work. So in this sense is what I put some emphasis between produce and non-produce commodities. I totally agree. Okay, I have one last question uh, where you can use it to also close uh, uh, this whole discussion. Uh, for both authors, uh, first in English by uh, Jova Al, oh, I, I can't read the whole name of the person who made the, well, it would seem according to Jay Moore that capitalist accumulation is stimulated by sources of demand that are outside the capitalist system. In this case, the incorporation of cheap nature so that capitalist accumulation is sustained and established in a greater consumption of these cheap natures on a global scale. If so, um, where is the role of the expansion of the production of individual capitals by the pressure of competition in this tendency of incorporation of cheap nature? Is it possible that competition between capitals on a global scale can dispense with the production of surplus value of the world wage earning class in all scenarios of capital accumulation? Well, this is the ultra monopoly capital uh, thesis. So no, I mean, I'm with Lenin against Kautsky on this, that, uh, that if you have such, such a high level of centralization at some point, you end up with a tributary mode of production. So that doesn't mean that there isn't uh, proletarianization and corporations and finance and everything, but we have to attend to those quantity quality transformations within capitalism itself that could lead to very much an authoritarian tributary mode of production. So um, I would say yes. And I want to say, uh, I apologize. I need to excuse myself to run off to my next meeting, but I was, very honored by this conversation. Juan, it was a privilege and an honor to hear you and to be in conversation with you, even if for much too short a time. I hope perhaps we can find another moment to uh, uh, pursue this conversation. Thank you, Jason. It was also an honor. And I think we can develop our debates maybe by writing something and follow it in next sessions or on our conferences. And All thank right. you to organizers also for this. Thank you very much. Yes, there will be definitely more opportunities